hour you shall begin to feel the whisperings of the Spirit of God, and the works of God shall begin to break forth. From this time you shall be endowed with power from on high. After an intermission, Joseph indicated that the first order of business would be the selection of the members of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. In June of 1829, the Lord had designated Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer to be those who would choose these twelve apostles. Martin Harris, the third of the three witnesses, became a part of that group. And they were directed by Joseph Smith in this meeting to prayerfully select twelve men from that audience who would become the twelve apostles. The revelation commanding Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer to choose the twelve had given the point that by their desires and their works these witnesses would be able to recognize the twelve. And so under the direction of Joseph Smith they came up with a group of names which were then reviewed by Joseph Smith. They selected such men as Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Pratt, and Parley P. Pratt. You had other prominent people Thomas B. Marsh becomes the president of the Quorum of the Twelve by virtue of seniority, even though he was one of the last ordained. He was not ordained until April. So they're very significant men. I don't think we can ever fully appreciate the power of these great apostles. After all of the Twelve were chosen and ordained, Oliver Cowdery presented the apostolic charge. In his apostolic charge, he rehearsed the duties and responsibility of members of the Quorum of the Twelve. And then he took each member by the hand and asked each whether he was willing to accept the charge that had been given to him. And each in turn answered, yes, he would. After the calling of the Twelve and Seventy, Joseph Smith responded to some of those in Kirtland who were disappointed that the members of Zion's camp did not have an opportunity to fight in Missouri. God did not want you to fight. He could not organize his kingdom with 12 men to open the gospel door to the nations of the earth and with 70 men under their direction to follow in their tracks unless he took them from a body of men who had offered their lives and who had made as great a sacrifice as did Abraham. Now the Lord has got his 12 and his 70 and there will be other quorums of 70s called who will make the sacrifice and those who have not made their sacrifices and their offerings now will make them hereafter. If you can imagine being asked uh, to come to Kirtland, leaving your farm, your property in New York and other places, you can therefore see how poor these people would have been having given up everything. Well, how do you solve that problem? To solve that problem, they came up with several businesses. You had the sawmill. You had an ashery. It provided a lot of needed money you know, because an ashery could produce good money. So it was a very important part of the economy. In our day and age, we take for granted the education and the privileges we have of obtaining an education. That was not the case in the 1830s. They did have some limited education. Joseph Smith had very basic, probably reading, writing, arithmetic, which would be typical of many, but not of all. Some had even not that much education. Uh, the girls didn't have as much education as that. After the prophet received a revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, which talked about becoming acquainted with good books and education, from then on, the church became very, very involved, and education was a very, very important part of the whole system. The Mill K. Whitney store was a very, very important part of the community in Kirtland. This is where life and the action was in Kirtland, because people came to purchase all kinds of items. Uh, get your thread, you could get your shoes. Of course, your shoes uh, did not have left or right. They became left or right by how you wore them. Uh, they had books, of course. Here, copies of the Book of Mormon would have been sold. So it really was where you came to purchase items for everyday life in Kirtland. 
out of here would have operated the first bishop's storehouse. So as the poor and the needy came to Kirtland, and there were many of them because they left everything they had and came to Kirtland, this great, gracious, good bishop would have provided for the needs of the poor of the community. Another very important part of the Mill K. Whitney store was when it was remodeled by Levi Hancock as residence for the Prophet Joseph. Could you imagine being Emma, really never having a place of your own, and living with one family after another? That must have been extremely difficult. But now at least she has part of a home, a store, but at least upstairs she would have had uh, some privacy. Also here you had a storeroom. Next to the storeroom was the translation room. This is a very, very important room because more revelations were received in that room than any other place in the history of the church that are recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. Here's where Joseph Smith finished the translation of the Bible. The room in the northwest corner of the building was built by Levi Hancock as a special room where they could have the School of the Prophets, which became a very, very important part of the training for missionaries as they went out to preach the gospel. Section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants outlines the procedure of the school, the curriculum of the school, uh, the characteristics of the school. And so in harmony with that particular revelation, the saints early in January began meeting in the Newell K. Whitney store. Most of these people were missionaries, but they came in from the mission field in order to receive instruction. Undoubtedly, the First Presidency was there, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams and many others. These people gathered early in the morning according to the instructions found in section 88. They were met by the prophet Joseph Smith. They took an oath of allegiance to the church, an oath which specified they were going to keep the commandments of the Lord. They were instructed and then according to section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, they participated in two special ordinances. One, they partook of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and also they participated in an ordinance of foot washing. This foot, ward, foot washing ordinance was described in section 88. It was in harmony with the ordinance that was performed by the apostles and by the Savior as described in the New Testament. This school of the prophets, as he called it, uh, was to follow some rather specific procedures. For example, no unworthy person was to be admitted to, as the Lord put it, pollute my holy house. So only worthy people were to be included in those who attended the School of the Prophets. Also, after the Word of Wisdom had been received, uh, those attending were required to live according to that principle. Furthermore, they accepted a commitment not to discuss outside of the school the sacred things that were presented there. So you see, in many ways, the procedures that were followed in the school were later followed in temple worship. The School of the Prophets was, in one sense, the first missionary training center. And Orson Pratt, who was one of the participants, said that the principle that he remembered he learned that was emphasized as much or more than anything else was the principle to rely and learn how to receive the Spirit of the Lord. But undoubtedly many subjects were taught in this first missionary training center. Secular subjects, religious subjects, Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and others would have undoubtedly been teachers. We also knew that there was discussions that took place in this school of the prophets. But the highlight was the vision of the Savior to members of the school of the prophets. Just imagine being taught by the prophet and then having the prophet tell you that he's preparing you to see the Savior. And he wrote to the leaders of the church in Missouri that he was preparing these people to see the Savior of mankind. March 18th, the people gathered. They fasted, they prayed, and during their prayers, the heavens were opened. And they testified that Jesus Christ appeared to the members of the School of the Prophets. And angels appeared and blessed the lives of the School of the Prophets. And one of the participants said that he also saw the Savior. John Murdoch, one of the early successful missionaries in the early history of the church, was boarding with the Prophet at the time the members of the School of the Prophets were meeting. And he also had a remarkable vision of the Savior. 
The prophet told us if we could humble ourselves before